Over three weeks, parts of the continental United States will see the sun completely blocked out by the moon. Total solar eclipse is exactly four weeks from today. On April 8th, an extraordinary event will occur. A total eclipse of the sun stretching across a path 115 miles wide, crossing through 13 states from Texas to Maine. The excitement is obvious as what are known as eclipse tourists hurry to secure travel plans to be in the eclipse's path. What terrifying prophecy will come true during the highly anticipated eclipse? Join us as we unravel the prophecy that will be fulfilled on April 8, 2024. The disturbing echoes of prophecy in modern times. As witnesses, we've seen a series of strange events lately that are beyond what we could have ever imagined. Think about it. From that mysterious tea outage one day to the sudden shutdown of Facebook and Instagram with no clear explanation. Reports even talk about the Red Sea being involved somehow, with rumors of cables being cut. Meanwhile, banks are still struggling a year after the banking crisis began in 2023. But amidst all this chaos, there's something else catching everyone's attention. The skyrocketing value of Bitcoin and gold. It's like the universe is trying to tell us something big is on the horizon. And if that wasn't enough, there's talk about tensions rising since the last election, with whispers of a possible civil war. Plus, there's the upcoming eclipse in the United States on April 8th, which is causing quite a stir. People are already planning trips and securing spots to witness this rare event where darkness will reign for over four minutes in some areas. This eclipse will cut a path 115 miles wide through 13 states, offering a celestial spectacle not seen every day. But what's interesting are the ancient scriptures that seem to foretell these events. Amos chapter 8 talks about the sun going down at noon and darkness covering the earth. Joel chapter 2 speaks of spiritual awakenings and prophecies coming true. And there's mention of wonders in the sky and on earth, with the sun turning dark and the moon appearing blood red before a significant day. Even in Luke 21, there's talk of signs in the heavens and distress among nations. It's like the universe is sending us a message and we'd better pay attention. When hearing about the upcoming eclipse, it feels like a signal from a higher power, our Father, trying to grab our attention. Throughout history, there have been signs like this, guiding us. For many, news of the eclipse confirms a feeling, almost like a whisper of what's to come. It brings to mind a story from the Bible, the one about the darkness in Egypt during Moses' time, a darkness so thick you could feel it, lasting for three days. There are parallels between that biblical event and what's to come. In the book of Revelation, there's talk of the fourth trumpet sounding, causing darkness to cover a third of the sky. It's as if ancient prophecies are aligning with what's happening now. But it's not just ancient texts. Reports of private revelations spanning centuries speak of thick darkness enveloping the world for three days. It's said that during this time, demons will roam freely and the air will be tainted. People will be urged to stay indoors, seeking protection through prayer and faith. These revelations also speak of a cleansing, a rebirth. They foresee turmoil and strife, but also a unification and renewal of faith. It's a vision of chaos followed by a new beginning, a triumph of mercy. Whether believed in or not, these visions certainly make you ponder. They raise questions about our future, about the world we live in. And on April 8th, when the eclipse occurs, it may serve as a reminder of these prophecies, prompting reflection on what's to come. So. Regardless of beliefs, it's worth considering what this all means for our shared humanity. In a time when it seems like the church is facing impossible challenges and enduring severe persecutions, there will be extraordinary events. As prophesied, the sun will reveal rivers of blood and the Virgin Mary will intervene to prevent the calamities planned. This period will be a great crisis intended by God to purify the church. Imagine an astonishing cyclone unleashed burning skies and a darkened earth. Plagues will emerge, revolutions will stir, and battles will rage. Black balloons will drift through the heavens, covering the earth with fire and darkness. The number of corpses outside Rome will be as numerous as the dead fish after a flood of the Tiber River. A plague-like darkness filled with horrifying visions will envelop the earth for three days. Despite the terror, prayers can ease the suffering on earth but heavenly punishments 
will be astonishing and universal. All enemies of the church, even those hidden, will perish in darkness, except for some whom God will later convert. The air will be tainted by demons appearing in horrifying forms. After the darkness, Saints Peter and Paul will descend from heaven, preaching throughout the universe and appointing a new popey. A great light will emanate from this chosen one. Interestingly, in 1844, in England, Teresa Higginson had a similar terrifying revelation. A shocking vision of divine judgment. She saw a thick, dark cloud enveloping the earth, symbolizing the darkness of human intelligence. Thunder roared, lightning flashed, and fireballs fell, causing devastation. Waves of water and cries of pain followed. Similarly, in 1854, Josefina Rovery experienced punishments raining down on nature, causing desolation. Those far from divine grace faced terror and death. There would be such violent earthquakes that men would lose their lives out of amazement. Men of horrific aspect would unleash terrifying howls, their hearts inflamed with the most brutal passions. A mob driven by bloodlust would plunge even the most steadfast souls into mortal terror. Houses will merge, and some will be destroyed by the scourge, while others will collapse under the rubble of burning buildings or in bloody trenches. The blood of the victims will flow into the ocean, and parts of the earth will become completely deserted. Without the power of God, nothing can sustain itself, and even the most devout souls will experience mortal anguish. There will be terrible storms that will move mountains, causing houses and buildings to crumble. A third of humanity will perish in that moment. The sun will darken, and thick darkness filled with demonic spirits will engulf the earth. The moon will turn as red as blood. Be warned and seek protection with blessed candles. A renewal of humanity is crucial, and everyone will be shaken beyond their strength. Pray. Pray fervently. After the persecution, the church will triumph and flourish. In 1905, Sister Faustina Kowalska prophesied that before coming as an impartial judge, Jesus would come as the King of Mercy. There will be signs in the sky, a darkness covering the earth, followed by the appearance of a cross and great lights emanating from where the Savior's hands and feet were nailed. This will happen shortly before the last day. Poland holds a special place, and if it obeys God's will, it will be elevated in power and holiness, becoming the spark that prepares the world for Jesus' final coming. In 1850 and 1941, Marie-Julie Jenny received revelations from Jesus. She described thunder shaking the earth, the foundations being moved, and the sea generating foaming and deafening waves that spread across continents. Three-fourths of humanity will perish during three nights and two days of continuous darkness. Only blessed candles will provide light in this horrible darkness. A single candle will suffice for the three days, but they will not burn in the homes of the wicked. Not even lightning, wind, or earthquakes will extinguish the lights of the blessed candles. Neither generous gifts nor heavenly signs will turn the people of that time into children of God. It will be a great and terrible day when the final judgment arrives. This day is not measured by earthly time, but by divine reckoning. During this time, the final selection of the living on earth will be made. Those who remain faithful amidst the unspeakable horrors will be saved clinging to the cross and invoking the name. During the three days of darkness, those given to their depraved ways will perish, leaving only a quarter of humanity to survive. The hour of the coming is near, and a terrible punishment will demonstrate the power. Those who trust in and spread the message should not fear, for protection will be granted. Seek refuge with the mother, and no harm will befall. Lock doors and windows and kneel before a crucifix, repenting of sins and seeking protection. During the earthquake, fire hurricanes will form in the clouds, spreading storms across the earth. A rain of fire will fall without interruption, while poisonous gases carried by the wind will spread. After three nights, the earthquakes will cease and the sun will shine again. Angels from heaven will bring a spirit of peace to earth filling those who survive with immense gratitude for having endured this terrible judgment of God. There will be tremendous punishments, and many people will perish like flies under the effect of insecticides. The sun will vanish, plunging the earth into darkness for three days and three nights. During this time, 
Only blessed candles will provide light. It's crucial not to leave your house. Keep windows and curtains closed and focus on prayer, especially the rosary. Wear sacramentals like the miraculous metal or scapular for protection against the upheaval. A strong burning wind will sweep from the south, causing storms worldwide. A thunderous noise will shake the earth, signaling the beginning of three days and three nights of total darkness. People should stay indoors, bless themselves, sprinkle holy water, and light blessed candles. Horrible things will occur outside, but those who dare to look will die of fear. Demons will roam freely, imitating the voices of loved ones to deceive and destroy. The blessed candles will only illuminate those who strive to live by God's commandments. Though they may seem small, they will last for three days and three nights without extinguishing. The earth will leave its orbit for three days, signaling the nearness of Christ's second coming. During this time, families should remain in continuous prayer. They should avoid opening the door to anyone and instead continue praying. It's important not to look through the windows to avoid witnessing God's justice falling upon the people. The time of seduction by the Antichrist will be dreadful, culminating in the three days of darkness. These days will put an end to evil on earth, ensuring that in the new heavens and new earth, there will be no more demonic influence on God's chosen ones. The three days of darkness represent the Armageddon mentioned in Revelation chapter 16. Armageddon is a powerful word that resonates deep within us, sparking imagination and creativity across various forms of art and storytelling. It's not just a term, it's a concept that has inspired countless books, movies, games, and paintings, each portraying its interpretation of the epic battle. The name itself conjures images of immense armies, untold suffering, and widespread destruction. But what exactly is Armageddon? And when will it happen? Terrifying ancient prophecies and modern interpretations. In truth, Armageddon finds its roots in the Hebrew phrase Har Magadon, meaning the mountain of Megiddo. This valley, located in the western part of the plain of Esdralon, holds significant historical importance. Throughout the ages, it has been the site of numerous significant battles involving various civilizations, including the Assyrians, Babylonians, Romans, Egyptians, Crusaders, and Muslims. According to biblical prophecy, the final conflict, known as the Battle of Armageddon, will unfold near the time of the second coming of Christ. While Megiddo serves as the starting point for this great battle, its focal point will ultimately be Jerusalem. Some mistakenly believe that the battle's climax will occur in Megiddo itself. However, ancient texts and interpretations suggest that the struggle will primarily revolve around Jerusalem, with Megiddo playing a significant but supporting role. Ezekiel's prophecies speak of a leader named Gog, representing a great evil power that will emerge in the last few days. This leader will gather nations from various regions, including Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, and others, allying against the chosen people of the Lord. While specific modern nations aren't explicitly named in these prophecies, they symbolize a coalition of forces opposing the remnant of God's chosen people. Thus, Armageddon becomes not just a battle, but a symbol of the ultimate struggle between good and evil as foretold in ancient scriptures. This idea makes sense because Ezekiel clearly states that the threat will come to Jerusalem from the northern regions. Ezekiel is specific that he is referring to the future, what he calls the latter days. He describes something Daniel also talked about, called the abomination that causes destruction, which will last for 1290 days. This is important because it marks a period just before Christ's second coming. However, it's crucial to remember that Daniel's prophecy has multiple layers of fulfillment. Some people might not like this idea because they feel it allows for too much interpretation rather than a clear mapping of prophecy to fulfillment. But many prophets, like Daniel and Isaiah, wrote in a way that allowed for multiple fulfillments. They predicted events that happened in their time during Christ's time, and will happen again in the last days. So when we consider Daniel's prophecy about the abomination of desolation, one fulfillment occurred when Christ foretold the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, saying that not one stone shall be left upon another. 
This was tragically realized in 70 AD when the Romans, led by Titus, raised Jerusalem and did away with around 1 million Jews. You can even see a commemoration of this victory in the Arch of Titus in Rome, which depicts the Romans taking spoils from the temple. However, in Doctrine and Covenants 84, the Lord warns of another instance of desolation and abomination awaiting the wicked in the last days. This shows that the prophecies of old continue to have relevance and will unfold again in the future. The passage states that those who serve the Lord are advised to go out into the world as much as their situations allow, fulfilling their various duties. They are instructed to visit cities and villages, shining a light on the wrongdoing and ungodliness that prevails. They are to do this by clearly explaining the prophecies found in the scriptures, particularly focusing on the abomination of desolation in the last days. This abomination, as prophesied by Daniel and mentioned by Christ in the New Testament, signifies a time of great turmoil, especially following the restoration of the gospel. According to Zechariah, all nations will gather against Jerusalem at the moment of Christ's second coming, indicating a massive conflict that extends from Jerusalem to Megiddo, possibly even beyond. The armies involved will be vast, described by Ezekiel as a storm and a cloud covering the land, by Daniel as a whirlwind, and by Joel as a devouring fire. John the Revelator adds to this imagery by describing the army as numerous as locusts, bringing devastation wherever they go. The count of this army is even given as 200 million. Despite the overwhelming odds, prophets like Joseph Fielding Smith suggest that the final conflict will culminate in the siege of Jerusalem. However, amidst this chaos, there will be two witnesses, described in the book of Revelation as candlesticks and olive trees, or in modern terms, two prophets. These witnesses will possess the sealing power, allowing them to call down plagues from heaven, holding back the army for three and a half years. They will exhibit miraculous abilities similar to the prophet Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, and they will have the authority to seal the heavens, preventing rain during this period. After three and a half years, the two prophets will be captured and killed by the opposing army. Their bodies will be left in the streets of Jerusalem for three and a half days while the forces of evil celebrate their demise. Then, the enemy army will ravage the city, destroying everything and everyone in their path. Zechariah predicts that only one-third of the nation of Israel will survive this horrific ordeal. Before this dark moment in Israel's history unfolds, several other significant events must take place. Just when it seems like Israel is facing complete annihilation, the Lord will unleash his fury upon the kingdoms of the world. He will personally fight against these nations, causing a massive earthquake that will shake the entire world. Fortunately, the righteous will be spared from this calamity if they obey God's commandments. However, those who refuse to follow his teachings will face the plagues and pestilence brought upon the wicked. To prepare for these stormy times, we can learn from history. Startling lessons from history and prophecy. Before the Roman siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD, Christians living in the city remembered Jesus' warning to flee to the mountains. Those who heeded this advice found safety in a city called Pella. Meanwhile, the Jews who remained in Jerusalem suffered greatly during the siege. Elder Bruce R. McConkie of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles explained that gathering together in holy places where they could receive prophetic guidance helped preserve the saints from the destruction of that day. Similarly, Jesus' prophecy recorded in Matthew 24, 1622 applies both to the tribulations faced by the Jews in 70 AD and to the trials that will occur in the latter days. Without the Lord's intervention, his people would face total annihilation. Thus, his divine intervention will be crucial for their survival. Although the Bible doesn't mention this event, historians have recorded that about four years before Titus initiated the siege on the city of Jerusalem, faithful followers of Christ noticed certain signs. Sensing the impending danger, they fled to a place called Pella. According to these historical accounts, not a single Christian believer lost their life in the ensuing battles because they had all heeded the warning and escaped to safety. It's interesting to note that the two witnesses prophesied to appear in the last days will also hold back the Armageddon army for three and a half years. 
This time frame seems reminiscent of the period ancient Christians had as a warning before the siege. Considering Daniel's prophecy can have multiple fulfillments, it's reasonable to assume that we, too, might need to seek refuge when Armageddon approaches. This three-and-a-half-year duration recurs frequently in Scripture. While we often hear about the importance of standing in holy places, Christ's message takes on a more urgent tone in this context. He essentially advises, when you see the signs, don't hesitate, leave immediately and seek refuge in the holy place in Zion. This will be the only way to ensure the safety of oneself and one's family. In a June 1989 Ensign article titled, Be Ye Also Ready, it is stated that the Lord foretold two major signs that would signal believers to flee. The first is the encirclement of Jerusalem by armies, and the second is the warning given to righteous individuals who will then warn others. When we are called to Zion, it will likely be in response to these signs. Ezra Taft Benson summarized the situation aptly, emphasizing the importance of being prepared physically, spiritually, and psychologically for the challenges that may arise suddenly, just like a whirlwind. In light of these prophecies, it's clear that there are tough times ahead, and it's crucial for every person to ready themselves for whatever may come. The coming event marks the final and decisive battle against Lucifer and all the demons of hell. But who really is Lucifer? And where did he come from? The shocking tale of pride and doom. Let's journey back to the ancient pages of the Old Testament to unravel the origins of Lucifer. In the Hebrew text, Lucifer's name originates from the word Helel, which carries the meaning of brightness. This designation, referring to Lucifer, paints a vivid picture of a celestial being, often associated with the morning star or the bright star, as depicted in the book of Isaiah. The passage in Isaiah paints a dramatic scene of a once lofty figure, now fallen from grace. It speaks of a being addressed as the day star or son of dawn, who has plunged from the heavens, bringing nations to their knees. The passage illustrates a profound rebellion, with the fallen one expressing grandiose aspirations to ascend beyond heavenly realms to rival the Most High. It's a gripping narrative depicting the tragic downfall of a celestial being consumed by pride and ambition. Let's analyze the background of this text. It discusses a mighty king from Babylon who, in his arrogance and grandeur, faces a downfall. But there's a deeper layer here. This passage isn't just about the mortal king himself. It addresses the force behind his wickedness. No earthly ruler would dare claim superiority over God or compare themselves to the Most High. The true power behind this Babylonian king's wickedness is none other than Lucifer, known as the Son of the Morning. Lucifer is another name for Satan, the leader of the evil world system. He's the hidden force guiding the rulers of Tyre, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, and all those dark rulers throughout history. This passage isn't just about human events. It delves into the origins of sin in the universe and the moment when Satan fell from grace in the pure, sinless realms before humanity existed. It's like peeking into the ancient roots of wrongdoing itself, long before humans walked the earth. In Ezekiel chapter 28, there's a similar story. The Lord tells Ezekiel to speak a lamentation over the king of Tyre. It's like a sad song for the king. The Lord says the king used to be perfect, full of wisdom, and very beautiful. He lived in Eden, surrounded by precious stones like carnelian and sapphire. The king was like a special jewel, placed by God as a guardian cherub on his holy mountain. He was blameless until he became sinful. His pride and greed led him to violence and sin. So, God cast him out from his mountain, exposing him to other kings. Because of his many wrongdoings, God brought fire from within him, turning him into ashes. Everyone who knows about him is shocked by his terrible end. It's a warning about the dangers of pride and corruption. This passage may seem to talk about the king of Tyre, but it's really about the one who's behind that evil king. It also predicts things about Lucifer. Even though his final punishment is certain, it hasn't happened yet and will occur after the final judgment. In both Isaiah and Ezekiel, Lucifer isn't just one person. It's about his influence working through earthly rulers who seek divine honors. These rulers might not even realize they're serving Satan's aims. 
The Bible tells us that our real enemies aren't just human, but spiritual forces of evil led by Satan. He's the one pulling the strings behind the corrupt world system. Take note of the phrase in the passage from Ezekiel, the anointed cherub. These words couldn't describe a human king, but they perfectly fit Lucifer or Satan, who is the power behind that king. This angel was the most magnificent creature ever made by the Lord. God said of him, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Satan was the smartest being God ever made. No other angel or being was gifted with the intelligence that God gave him. God also said this creature was perfect in beauty. Besides the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this creature stands as the highest being today. In Ezekiel 28, it mentions, you were the anointed cherub. This makes it clear that we're not talking about a human king. The word cherub is singular for cherubim. Cherubim represents God's holy presence and his incredible majesty. They hold a special place in God's realm. The anointed cherub who covers is a picture from the Garden of Eden. After Adam and Eve were banished, God placed cherubim to guard the way to the tree of life. Also, when Moses crafted the mercy seat for the tabernacle's holy of holies, God's glory came and dwelled between the cherubim. They shielded the mercy seat with their wings. So we learn that Satan was once a cherub tasked with guarding God's throne. His role was to protect God's holiness. Satan held the highest position, which he disdained and lost. In Ezekiel, we see a depiction of God's most magnificent creature, brimming with wisdom and indescribable beauty, even a musician, and placed in an exalted position. But despite all these remarkable qualities, this creation had free will. One day, God discovered iniquity in this marvelous being. What kind of iniquity or wrongdoing did he commit? In the book of Ezekiel, God takes us back to the very beginning to witness the creation of Satan. But why does God show us this? What did Satan do wrong? Let's go back to Isaiah 14, which reveals Lucifer's rebellion. I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of assembly on the heights of Zaphon. I will ascend to the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Did you notice all the I wills in this passage? Satan declared he would elevate his throne above God's angels. The word stars here refers to the angels of God, not the ones we see in the night sky. Essentially, Satan said, I will take over heaven, I will be God. That's Satan's sin and the wrongdoing found in him. He refuses to serve God and fulfill his created purpose. Instead, he desires to be worshiped and many have chosen to serve him, believing his lies. Eve fell for his deception, thinking she could be like God. Satan tempted her with this because it's what he desires to be God. Certainly, we don't want to follow Eve's path of being deceived. So, knowing from Bible prophecy that the day of judgment is coming, we're urged to live in reverence and recognition of God. That's the only way to avoid the impending disaster. What do you think about the coming eclipse in association with biblical prophecies? Let us know your opinion in the comments below. And if you enjoyed watching this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.